Welcome to story He says it all still means something He's still making things out of nothing And that's how I know I just really, really love God a lot. I was talking to, um, we have this sweet nanny, Anaya. She lives with us, and she was an intern with my ministry. And last night we were um, in the kitchen. And you know what I said? I said, man, I really thank God that I had a lot of darkness in my story. I really do. Uh, I mean, sexual trauma and abuse from family members, lost my virginity at 13, if you don't know my story. Started drinking to numb the pain, then that didn't work. Started smoking weed to numb the pain. Slept with a whole bunch of guys, battled with an eating disorder. And I told her, I said, man, there was a moment when I was like, God, you have to take the pain away. This really sucks. That so much darkness has entered my story. But now I'm like... God, I'm so thankful because it brought me to you. I wouldn't have been as desperate. This isn't about falling into the pain comparison trap. It's just about setting the stage for who he is. The God of the valleys. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. You have to stop with the key. It's keeping me there. You have to stop. No, just kidding. Guys, give it a fire. Amazing band. We have such a good worship team. It's kind of crazy. I get to travel a lot and speak and all that good stuff. I go to churches. Amazing. Organizations. Amazing. But we, let me just, I'm not, no comparison here, but we have a really great worship team. I'm just going to put that out there. Mm-hmm. I know. We take it for granted sometimes because these suckers are amazing. But you know they're amazing because when you be singing in your own seat and you catch like a, like a little bit of yourself, you're like, I could never do that. I actually sound horrible, you know? Um, okay. So for those of you that don't know me, just realize there's so many first-time visitors here. My name's Tony, okay? And I am Pastor Sam's wife. That's what's actually happening. I, I get to preach um, here at the home team, but I also travel a whole bunch and preach and teach all over the world. And huh, there is really nothing like being in your home church I also just want to say, if it's your first time witnessing me, there's two things that you need to know. My outfit right now is what my personality is, okay? I just want to warn you because you caught like Holy Tony just now, but I'm crazy, okay? I just want to say that because they're going to be like, whoa, who's this girl? But it is what it is, okay? God made me this way. I'm a Teletubby bopping around, the orange Teletubby, the new Teletubby, you know? Um, And so I'm a little crazy. I'm a little wild. It just is what it is. So You'll get some remnants of that in the, the message here. Um, do I have any swimmers in the room? We can just go ahead and put that picture up on the screen. I'm gonna, this is like your home, t- yeah, this is like your home turf. Any swimmers in the room? Okay, look at you go. One singular human being. Okay, <laughs> two, three, okay, oh, oh, four. oh my gosh, okay, okay. Uh, this is great. I am not, okay? <laughs> And I want to tell you a story real quick. Um, I've told this story before, but there's just so many new people here. I was like, no, they really need to hear this. This is gonna be great. When I was in the middle school, I, um, I was in everything. I was like captain of the cheerleading team, step team. I mean, all the things, just performing my way through life, you know? And I caught this like flyer in the cafeteria and it was like, join the swim team today, right? And I was like, oh, it's my season. Like, I need to join the swim team as well. Like, I'm going to have new friends. It's going to be amazing. I rip the little flyer off. I go home. I'm in the living room with my mom. I'm like, mom, I'm going to join the swim team. She said, no, you're not. I said, what do, you, what do you mean? She said, well, first of all, you can't swim. I said, well, you're a hater. I actually didn't say that, but I thought it because she would have hit me, okay? She said, you can't, you can't swim. Do you remember last summer in the neighborhood pool when you jumped in the deep end with a pool noodle and you almost drowned when it lifted up from underneath you? I was like, yes, I do remember that. I'm better now, okay? And she was like, no, ma'am, okay? It's just you can't swim too. I was like, mom, I got this, okay? Prideful, right? Like, I'm the best, okay? And she said, number two, what you going to do about your edges? I was like, oh, uh-uh. Okay. I said, no, mama, they make swim caps. You just squeeze them onto your head and your hair just like, it's like fine. And she's like, listen to me, you're going to mess up your hair. It's going to all fall out. Okay. I said, no, it's not, mom. Come on, let me do it. She said, okay, you can give it a try. I said, bet. Y'all, I got everything for the swim team. Okay. I went to Walmart, got me a little black one piece because that's all you could wear. No colors, unfortunately. Um, And I also got some goggles, the one with the little nose, you know what I'm saying? So the water don't get in your nose. Now, for those of you that swim, you're laughing right now because as I went to my first swim practice, I had my little big goggles on with the nose and the coach said, hey, 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 no, 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 you can't wear those. I said, no. 
want to get water in my nose. I don't know. What do you what do you mean? He's like, no, you got to learn how to breathe with the, I said, no, you don't. What are you talking about? I don't understand. He said, listen, if you dive into the water and you hit your face, I mean, you could like break your nose. I said, whoa, this is really intense. I mean, what are you guys doing here? He's like, we're professional swimmers. I was like, okay. So I switched it out for the little goggles. And I'm gonna be honest with y'all. I just didn't practice. I mean, I just, I don't know. I was so enamored by the fact that I could just like play in the pool <laughs> at school in the middle of the day. I was just like bopping around and I was making fun of people. My coach kept saying, hey guys, swim meets in a couple weeks, swim meets in a couple weeks, you gotta prepare. And I was like, I don't need to prepare, whatever. I'm a mermaid, okay? Um, and so, <laughs> I know, somebody's like, she's crazy, I know. The rest of you guys are like, no, she really is crazy. Surprise, just sit in it, okay? And so um, the, the first meet comes, and it's like one of those, I don't know, like little, it's like a fake meet, you know, and all the other students from different schools come out, and it's like a practice meet type situation, and I'm so excited, and our, our, our coach just gives out our assignments, and he's like, okay, we want you, Tony, to do the freestyle 400. He's like, super easy. I'm like, I know, I'm a mermaid, and it's really just like swimming like this kind of situation, you know, like regular swimming, okay, for four laps. Like you just go down, you come back, you go down, you come back, you're done. I'm like, got it, okay? I have not practiced a lick. Let me just be honest, okay? I was in for the battle of my life. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to just, just give you a little uh, dramatic irony here. Y'all, I get on the little, I don't even know what it's called. That goes to show you I'm not a real swimmer. But the little square boxy thingamajigger. And I'm doing my thing. I'm so excited. The other students are all lined up, and they look so serious, y'all. I mean, I said, what? As a, hey, how are you guys doing? My name's Tony. They literally would not look at me, y'all. I said, okay, so serious out here or whatever. Put my little goggles on. They three, two, one, count it down, blow the whistle. I dive in, belly flop. I know. It all went downhill immediately, okay? Immediately. Now, unfortunately, I have to, like, get some momentum. So I get on my tippy toes like this, and I go down. You know what I'm talking about? And then I push off the wall, and I'm like, off to the races. Here I go. I'm like, stroke, stroke, stroke. Ha! <sighs> breathe so you won't die. Stroke, stroke, stroke. Breathe. I mean, I'm doing great, okay? I get down to the end of the little run, and I have to do, like, this front flip thingy. I don't know if you've seen the swimmers, like the Olympics, Michael Phelps and them do it, but you essentially have to, like, flip forward, and then you're supposed to, like, turn around and push off the wall and keep it going. It, like, keeps the momentum. I'm like, I'm about to crush it. I'm a cheerleader, okay? I can flip. I go, go, go. I flip. I forgot to turn around, okay? I'm facing the wrong direction at this point, okay? So all I did was just <laughs> turn around like this, did a little tippy toe thing again, went down, pushed off. I'm off to the races again. I'm on my second lap. I'm doing great. Stroke, stroke, stroke. Breathe so you don't die. Here's what I noticed. These tadpole children have lapped me, y'all. I don't think you understand. I really thought I was going fast, okay? I was not. They're on their fourth lap, and I'm on my second, which means they quite literally have already come down. They went back, and now they're with me. Now, here's the deal. I am out of breath. I don't know if you've ever tried to swim fast. See, when y'all raised y'all hands, y'all were like, ooh, Jamaica. No, 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 okay? If you have ever tried to swim, I want you to try it this summer. Like, go fast for a long time. Y'all, I was dying. I was breathing hard like I had run a marathon. I start swallowing water. I'm like, I'm about to die. I'm, I'm in middle school. I have the rest of my life ahead of me, and I'm about to die because I wanted to be on the swim team. So you know what I did? I said, I'm going to cheat. That's what I said. I said, I'm going to get out when they all get out. <laughs> right? Because who is going to notice? <laughs> I'm with them. We all are swimming again. Who's going to notice that I didn't do two laps? Right? That I, only, that I just did the first two and not the second two. Nobody. Okay? Y'all, I get to the end of that water. They unfortunately still got out before me. But I just hopped right on up and just started walking to the, to, to the locker room. My coach is like blowing the whistle. He's like, Antoinette, that's my full name. Antoinette, Antoinette, Antoinette. I'm like, I'm good. Everything is fine. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm just going to head out and see you in a little while. The battle of my freaking life, y'all. I could have lost everything, y'all. My whole entire life. Y'all, I went in the locker room. I had my little Nokia phone. I'm like texting my mom. I'm like, three, 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 four, 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 four. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember? Okay, see, y'all got the little iPhone and stuff. Yeah, the Blackberry. No, I'm talking about the phone where you got to touch the numbers just to touch. Mom, 666. Six, 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 six. I mean, you, anyways, okay. I text my mom. I'm like, come and get me, bro, okay? I get in the car, and ooh, it ain't nothing like a mom with an attitude. She said, how it went? How'd it go, swim, swim girl? I said, great. 
It was awesome. So good. They're probably going to make me the manager. So I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, straight up lie. Mom's like, "Mm mm-hmm, drove off. Here's the truth, family and friends. I was not prepared for that battle. But why wasn't I prepared? Because my crazy behind wasn't practicing, okay? I wasn't practicing. I, I wasn't taking it seriously. I wasn't prepared for the battle that was I almost lost my life in that freaking pool, okay? And here's a question I want to pose to you today. Are you prepared for your battles in life? Are you living on the offense or the defense? I, when Sam told me that I could preach today, I was like, yes, awesome. I got a freaking word. I'm excited. I'm crazy, y'all. Just remember, okay? I just want to keep saying it so that you don't get it twisted. I said, I'm excited because I've been processing this posture for a while, living on the offense, not the defense. What has happened in many of our lives is that for some odd reason, we are very reactive to what life serves us up. It's almost like we don't know that we live in a fallen, broken world with temptation and sin and darkness. And so when darkness comes into our story, we're like, oh, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And we're not prepared for the things that come our way. I'm prepared when anxiety comes because I have practices that help the vagus nerve system. I'm prepared when financial strife comes because I've saved up my money and I'm not spending everything and making it rain everywhere. I'm prepared and on the offense for when tension comes into our marriage because we have worked on our marriage. We've gone to counseling. We've created little systems and boundaries and accountability. So when a little rift comes, we are prepared. The other thing I'm prepared for is when the enemy tries to bop his little ratchet behind in my life. How am I prepared for that? Because I've been faith building for years. I've been reading my word, even the long uh, like books like Leviticus. They got all them names in it. That is a boring book of the Bible. And it's weird, man. It's like the baby calf. They're like getting the altar ready. It's crazy. I have been tending to my personal relationship with the Lord. This, this is not faith building. I'm actually pouring out my faith right now. But it's what I do in my house, in my car, because I got kids and they're distracting It's what I do when I crack open my Bible, when I read my word, when I worship unbridled. I'm living on the offense. I'm ready for the enemy when he comes. As a matter of fact, sometimes I get excited because I see him coming. Woo! I'm like, come on, what you got? You want to attack my kid? Don't you worry. I already sprinkled a little holy oil on her last night. You trying to attack my marriage? Oh, baby, this marriage submits to God. I don't know what you're talking about. We, we are chasing after both of us, our faith in God. That's what makes us stronger, not each other. Ain't no codependency here, baby boy, okay? My guy. That's how I talk to the enemy, okay? <laughs> I do. I be ready because he's familiar to me. I know him. I lived 21 years outside of the will of God doing everything. I know the enemy. And because of those parts of my story, I know how to fight him too. And today I want to share with you a message or a scripture from the Bible that shows us some some key things on how to live on the offense, not the defense when it comes to our faith. Now, we're going to Judges. Another, I mean, it's an exciting book, but it's not as fun. So that means we got to crack out our Bibles today. Get your phones out with your your Bible app and all the things. I got mine. And we are going to read and dissect the word of God. You can almost think of this service. We've already had worship, but this part of the service as Bible study. Because we are not here in church to produce just worshipers. We're also here to sharpen theology. Because if you have looked around, Christianity, the Bible, the truth of who God is and his word has been tested and pushed up against. And so as believers, we have to be prepared with his word to understand it, to know it, to dive into context and not just skim through it like it's just a little kid's book. There is no junior Holy Spirit, but we about to read this word. So we're in Judges 4, Judges 4. Now, the beginning of almost every book of the Bible, unless it's a story that's being told and it weaves through the chapters, lots of the books give you context for what's getting ready to happen. Those first couple of sentences, those first paragraphs, it's really important for you to dive into so that you can understand the context of what's going on. Here's what's going on. This is not uh, in my notes, but I just want to tell it to you. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. Now, 
If y'all know anything about the freaking Israelites, oh, they're crazy. God rescued them out of Egypt. They're like, yes. I mean, there's so many of them. They're like, woo, they're following Moses. They're like, yay. And at almost every turn, they're questioning God. They're mad at God. They're upset. They're like, we want to go back to slavery. What? No. What are you talking about? They want to go back to the familiar. Because living a life on the offense ain't easy. It requires grit, strength, hope, fight. It requires sometimes wallowing in the valleys with God until you get to mountains of hope. God had promised them a mountain. He promised them a place, Canaan. But right now they were in the valleys and unfortunately, they again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. And the commander of his army's name was Sisera. Remember that name, Sisera, if you're writing notes. This is like a little Bible study, okay? Who lived in Harasheth Hagoyim. I mean, it's, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots, Sisera, had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Now, unfortunately, they are sitting in the valley of their bad decisions. They are sitting right now in the reality that they sinned against God again, and now they have been held captive by this king for 20 years. Now, I find it very interesting that these suckers were there for 20 years until they cried out to God. Why didn't y'all do it sooner? Because sometimes our darkness is familiar, isn't it? Sometimes we want to go back to Egypt because it's familiar there. When God is really calling us to a land of milk and honey. He's really calling us to live a life on the offense, trudging, fighting, doing everything that we can to get to his promises. But sometimes we get familiar and we sit in chaos and so, but after 20 years, praise the Lord, the Israelites finally cried out to God, Lord, help us, please save us, okay? This is what happened next. You can put it on the screen. So verse four says this, now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She's a prophetess. They come to her for judgment. She is a connection to God, to the Israelites, okay? So they've got to come to her for their judgment, for their next steps. They've cried out. God's like, I got you. Go speak to Deborah. She's going to tell you some next steps, okay? Now, she used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, go gather your men, at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army. Remember, Sisera. To meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops. And I will give him into your hand. <laughs> and this is what. So listen, let me just, I'm going to stop so y'all can get some context. So we've got Deborah, we've got the Israelites. They're like, please help us. What are our next steps? Deborah looks at them and says, has not the Lord told you what to do? Bring Barak, the leader of their army. Bring Barak. I'm going to tell him what to do. She tells him what to do. Again, that the God has already told them to do this. She tells him again, has not the Lord. This is what Barak said. He said, okay, now if you go with me, okay, I'm going to go. But if you don't, I'm not going to go because I'm scared. This is a man talking to a woman saying, you got to come with me because I'm a little nervous. And she said, okay, surely I'll go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. So because you're scared out here and you need someone to come hold your hand after God's already told you what to do and what he will do, that he will defeat this army, that you just need to take your 10,000. I know you're scared of the 900 chariots, but if you just go and do it, maybe you will get the glory for it. But because you won't, because of your fear, you won't get the glory. And then this is what she said to him. For the Lord will sell Sisera, the leader of the army, the bad army, into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. Now, here's the key thing we need to get out of this verse. It's this right here. Has not the Lord. I want you to understand the context of what's happening. This is not the first time what Deborah's telling them to bring your men up. 10,000 men. 
And he, God will, he literally said, I will deliver the leader of their army, Sisera, into your hand. Meaning you will defeat them with my power. He's already told them this. But they're so filled with fear and doubt. They're so afraid of their enemy that they have to go hear it from Deborah again. So when Deborah asks the question, has not the Lord, she's literally saying, didn't God tell you this already? Didn't God already promise you something? And I think someone in the room needs to remember this question when you're facing battles. Has not the Lord, has not the Lord sent his son Jesus to die for your sins? Has not the Lord already claimed victory in your life? Has not the Lord already promised that you can heal the sick and cast out demons and call on miracles into the earthly realms? Has not the Lord said that if you go to him, he will give you everything that you need? Has not the Lord said that his burden is light? That it won't crush you, the pain won't crush you? But we forget that, don't we? When we get into a valley, when we experience pain, we start turning to all of our vices. We start turning to weed, we start turning to alcohol, we start turning to all the things that gives us pleasure, that numbs us. We start turning to our idols because I think we don't remember. I think one of the attacks of the enemy is to block our memory. To block, bl blocking our memory says this, God's not done it before. So he, there's no way he can do it again. But when we begin to remember and we tell our weary souls, has not the Lord? Has not the Lord done it before? Does that not mean he'll do it again and again and again and again in your life? I think some of us in the room just need to, maybe this is just it for you. You just need to remember all that he's brought you through. All right, we're diving back into the word. This is my favorite. All right, verse 12. We're skipping over. Verse 12. All right, when Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out his chariots. It's go time, baby. We're about to hit the war, okay? It was 900 chariots of iron. Y'all, I don't have enough time to explain and break down how much that is, but it's like a thick army, okay? People, when they hear this, they shake in their pants because it's a huge army, way greater than the 10,000, okay, that Barak had. And all the men who were with him, from Harasheth Hagoam to the river of Kishon, and Deborah said to Barak, get up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. The thing that I want to pull out of this text is this right here. Get up. I think that I am at the end of myself with weak Christians. Get up. Excuse me? Do we not have the power of Christ living on the inside of us? Did the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 not say to us that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness? Has he not said that he's close to the brokenhearted and revives those that are crushed in the spirit? Has he not said that he will come for us and give us everything that we need to defeat anything in this world? I am sick. I think I'm sick because I've seen darkness and I've seen the hand of God. There was one time that, that me and Sam went to this church in, in Pennsylvania and we're doing an altar call and people are coming up and we're talking about physical ailments and disease. And this woman comes up and I just spot her out and I'm like, I got to get off the stage. I got to go to her. And I go down the green room back to the whatever. And I come down and I just lay my hand on her stomach and I said, spirit of God, come right now. By your blood, Jesus, you will heal this woman. Had no idea who she was, didn't know what she was going through. Maybe she had a physical ailment, maybe she didn't, okay? Because you know, you'd be doubting when you pray. I'm like, Lord, is this going to work? I don't know. Okay, it's you, it's you, it's you, not me. It's not my power, it's yours. And I'm praying for her. And I'm like, Lord, bring healing, bring healing, bring healing. We get back home to Atlanta. And a week later, the church sends us an email. It's this woman and she's saying, hey, 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 can someone please get this to Tony Collier? I just have to tell her what God did through her. I had this tumor in my stomach. Tony laid her hands on me and she prayed for healing and she prayed for strength. I went back to the doctors and poof, it's gone. Get up. We 
have the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I have experienced all the different churches. I grew up Catholic. My mom and them was Baptist. I went to a charismatic church. Then I went to North Point, which we love so much, but it ain't charismatic. If you just, if you know, if you've been, you've been, you've been, okay? I have seen all the different flavors of ministry, but let me tell you something right now. When you get into a room full of desperate people who want healing and deliverance and saving, things change. But they only change through activators, through people that actually believe that we have the power of Christ to heal, to cast out demons, to heal the sick. Not by my will, Lord, but by yours be done. Get up. If I am going to spend however many years on this earth, if you are going to spend however many years on this earth, spend it doing the work of God. Spend it healing people. Spend it just blowing people's minds with how amazing God really is. Spend it being less of you and showing more of him because when we do that, he becomes bigger in the the world. He becomes so much bigger in the world, people start to really believe. The other night, I'm having mommy-daughter date with with my daughter and she's just so excited. She's just living her little life. She thinks she's so cute. She's looking in the mirror. And I'm, I got the Bible playing in the background and I'm like, oh my goodness. And it's talking about heaven. And I turn to her and I'm like, oh daughter, I can't wait until I get to heaven. And she goes, oh, okay, wait, 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 wait. I want to get to heaven. I was like, girl, yeah, you can get to heaven too. All you need to do is just receive salvation. She's like, that thing that we do at the end of church. I'm like, yeah. And I say, you just got to say yes to Jesus. And then it's a hard road, but it's a road that's worth it. She's like, I want to receive it right now. I mean, we're in the car and I'm like, um, oh, all right. It's funny because I've done this so many times. I've been on so many stages. I've given, I mean, helped people get to salvation so many times. My own daughter is staring at me in the face and I just hear the spirit of the Lord say, get up. I pull over the car and I'm like, let's do it right now. And I said, baby, just repeat after me. I said, but close your eyes, put your heart over your hands so that you know it's inside of you. And I walk her through the salvation prayer. And let me just tell you something. My daughter's behavior started to change. I'm not, listen, I, listen, it, it, we are parents. It is hard. It is what it is, okay? These small children are like, like drunk little, I don't know, little babies walking around. It's crazy. They're crazy. But I'm not kidding you. I, a couple of weeks afterwards, our nanny came up to us. She said, is Dylan different to you? I was like, bro, Yes. I mean, we have a little eight-month-old son, and I mean, Dylan, she started, like, getting his bathtub and putting it down in the bath. She's like, Mom, I set up everything for you already. I'm like, who is that? Transformation. Real holy. Listen, there ain't no Holy Spirit Junior out here, baby. The same Holy Spirit that's working on us in this room is working in our babies right now in Children's Church. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead is in us right here in this room and in our babies right now. But we got to get up. We've been sitting in our Christianity for too long. It's time for us to get up and get strong. Start doing the work of God. But we got to remember. We got to read his word. We have to be a crip. We can't be looking stupid out here, not knowing the scripture, praying over people. We don't even know how to pray. We're like, uh, do you think, Lord? It's like, come on. Okay. All right. <laughs> what are you talking about? And the reason why we can have such fever, such zeal is is literally because he's already equipped us with it. That's what's so beautiful about this scripture. Deborah's saying, get up. Today is the day that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. I mean, can you imagine? Like, they've got this army. It's 10,000 of them, but it's not as much as the other army, okay? And, And Deborah's like, okay, come on, get up. Like, let's go. And I just love so much that in this story, the woman is the one that's like, what you doing? Come on, God said get up. I mean, he's shaking in his boots. This, this army is like, is God going to do it? Is God going to do it? Is he really going to do it? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm, all right, get up. Deborah's like, come on. Let's go see what God's going to do. Because she believes him. She believes God at his word. When you're feeling weary, fam, when you don't know what else to do, where else to turn, trust God at his word. He said he would do it. And he will. And that'll give you the fire and the strength that you need to just get up. Here's what happened at the end of the story. This is my favorite part. Okay. You got it up there? Okay, you're doing your thing. All right, you're doing your thing. All right. 
Yep, okay, boom. All right, so verse 16. Okay, Barak pursued the chariots and the army and Harasheth Hagoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. I mean, it was a complete takeover. And if you want to do a deep dive into this scripture, you have to go like deep dive as to how they actually got taken over. Like God made this like, okay, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I love the word. We're going to just keep going. It, but it's great what God did. And so I'm going to leave it there so that you can go home and go study what happened. Okay. Um, all right, not a man was left, but Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael. Now, the leader of their army, the bad army, Sisera, was like, I'm out, bro. He left all, all of his men, all the little chariots, the little horses was bopping around. He was like, I'm out, bye. And he goes up to this mountain, right? He goes to the tent of Jael, the wife of Haber, the Canaanite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazer, and the house of Haber, the Kenite. Now, this is what this is saying. Sisera was like, I'm going up to this tent because these are our friends. It's a, I'm going to be straight here. I got, this is going to be safe. Okay, so Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, turn aside, my Lord. Turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent. He got on in the tent. She covered him with a rug. And now, listen, she's not a harlot, okay? I just want to give you all context. Oftentimes, the men and women had different tents because the men would go out and be in danger, and so they protected the women. So she's not just a harlot out here, okay? All right. So he turned aside into the tent. She covered him with a rug, and he said to her, okay, please give me a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty, been fighting all day. So she opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. And he said to her, okay, stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, is anyone here, say no. But Jael, the wife of Haber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she softly went into the tent, and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. Listen to me. What a change of events. You know what I'm saying? You, I saw your faces. It's like a movie. It's like, oh, God, she got away. Went up to the tent, found an ally. He's laying down all clean. He didn't got some milk. It's like, dang, we really thought we were going to get him. JL comes around the corner. She's like, do, do, do. I mean, freak, right? Like, that's so cool. It's so exhilarating. That's why the Bible is so amazing. See, you don't, you don't know all these things are happening, but this is like good stuff. It's like a soap opera. Anyways, here's what's amazing. <laughs> what's amazing, what I pull out of this text is this right here. God has a plan Z. Listen to me. I know that you've tried plan A. I know. I know you tried plan B and C and D and you've tried to stop the addiction and you have tried your best to stop cheating on your wife. I'm just calling everybody out. It don't matter. Um, you tried your best to stop shopping because it makes you feel good inside, but you're spending all your money when you know you should be a better steward over it. You've tried plan E. You've tried to maybe get some friends around you, have a little accountability. It's okay, I got it, I got it. You've tried plan G. Maybe you went to counseling and it's like, oh, good Lord, counseling. Let me tell you something. God has a plan Z. He has not forgotten you. That sucker will come up from the okie doke in the back room and slip up under something and come up and redeem and save you like nobody's business. It's crazy in this story that JL, who was a friend of Sisera, they were at peace, felt something from the Lord and said, mm -mm, I know this battle and I know that God said that you would be defeated. And maybe Deborah couldn't do it. And maybe Barrett couldn't do it, but I'm going to fulfill the word of God. And I'm going to kill you behind, okay? Now, this is obviously not condoning murder, guys, okay? Things are getting a little weird here in the room, okay? This is Old Testament. Stop it, okay? We got rules now. Thank you, Moses. God has a plan Z, fam. You don't have to just, oh, there's some of you, you've been waiting. You've been waiting for so long for the man of your dreams, for the woman of your dreams, for the person that God has for you. You've been waiting so long for a better job. God has not forgotten about you. He will make a way out of no way. He'll do it. Your waiting is not done in vain. Nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, is wasted, family. Nothing. God will do it again and again and again and again. At the final hour, he's the best. He does his best work in the valleys. He is the ultimate redeemer. Believe him at his word. So here's the thing I want to leave you with. This is just a nice little beep beep, some one, two steps. All I need you to remember today is this right here. Remember, have grit, rinse and repeat. 
Rinse and repeat. Remember, have grit, rinse and repeat. You want to live a life on the offense, not the defense when it comes to your faith. You want to wake up and actually experience real joy. You want your marriage to thrive? Remember God at his word. Remember that he's done it before and he'll do it again. When all seems hopeless and lost, like, oh, God's not going to come through. This is over. I can't believe it. There is still a thread, a small, tiny little piece that hangs off like at the back of your suit that God will take and transform the whole thing because the truth is a thousand years to God is only but one second to us. And one second to us is like a thousand years to God. He does not work on our time. So remember what he's already done so that it can give you the strength to remember he'll do it again. Have grit. Come on, we got to start getting up. We got to start being strong. And not that weird strong that's toxic. Not the one that everybody used to tell us, right? Like, get up, you fine. Get get yourself together. Stop. No, the kind that's healthy, the kind that says, all right, I need to stare my pain in the face. I got some issues. I got some problems. I need to go heal that before I start to lead out of that place because it's messy. The kind that says I'm going to go do my work in counseling with friends and community and accountability. And then when I have the strength, you best believe I'm standing on the front lines. Woo! Excuse me? I say this all the time. People are like, aren't you so happy that you get to be on stages? And da, 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 da. I call this, this is a tower of ministry. And towers are great. I am grateful, hear me when I say that I get to do this. Get to do this. I still wake up every single morning. I'm like, Lord, don't let me mess this up because I'm about three old fashions and a skinny dip away from losing it all. I just am. I still got the temptation. It just runs right through me. When you got darkness in your store, you want to go back to, I mean, it's like a magnet. I'm like, oh, I want to smoke a little bit. Like, I mean, it's true. I just want to take a few shots. It's like, no, sis, okay? You are going to skinny dip randomly, okay? It's just going to take over your little body. I am a wild girl. It is what it is. I think about doing wild things sometimes. But it is not at all the towers of ministry that get me fired up. You know what it is? The trenches. It's looking someone in the eye. It's, it's, it's getting off the stage and going to the person that, that God's calling you to and laying your hand and just proclaiming healing in the name of Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. He'll show your face so that we can give you glory. And getting an email a week later and her saying, I've been healed, not by Tony, but by what God has done. I love, I love the trenches. And the truth is we all have an opportunity in the trenches to practice our faith. Your trenches may be your family that need you. Your trenches may be at work. And don't get fired out here, you know what I'm saying? Be smart. But maybe it's through the kindness you can do in your neighborhood. Come on, when's the last time you did something randomly kind for someone? When's the last time you practiced the fruit of the Spirit's genuinely patience and kindness and self-control and gentleness? When's the last time you were like Jesus with skin on for somebody? Stand in the trenches, y'all. Because when you start to pour out of your faith, I'm telling you, bro, it builds your faith. You don't need to see a miracle in your own life to love and, and get excited about the power of God. You can see it in someone else's if you start to get in stories and trenches. Start to see what God is doing. It's beautiful. Now, there are some people in this room that's like, that's awesome. But I am, uh, I haven't even taken the first step yet. I don't even really know Jesus very well. And that's okay, too, because you, too, can live on the offense, not the defense, starting today. Now, there, let me just, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to just say this. Now, this may be offensive, but I'm just going to say it because it is what it is. Maybe I, I'm feeling it from the Lord. In the next couple of moments, I'm going to do a salvation situation. And you know what's going to happen? Two things. People aren't going to raise their hand or they're not going to stand up for two reasons. One, because we're literally sitting in a room full of believers. So there just isn't anybody, right? Like there's just not anybody. Or two, they're just, we're just shy. We're just not sure. Like, I just don't know. And if you're not ready, you're not ready. No pressure. But it can't be like, I'm shy. I don't know. It can be, you know what? I just, I want to process it. I want to get myself in the right mindset. Sure. Okay. Let me tell you why those two things are problems. Number one. The fact, if, if there is only believers in this room, we're doing it wrong. 
Not us as a staff and not us as pastors, you. Because you haven't invited anyone here. You haven't told anyone about God. Do you even know anyone that's not a Christian? How are we supposed to spread and build the kingdom, fam? How? What are we going to do? We're just going to keep worshiping with other worshipers and never see the hand of God in someone's life bring real transformation and life change? That's going to hurt our faith because we won't. We'll stop seeing transformation. We need a, it, our faith feeds off of what God does. We have to put ourselves in those places and bring other people in. Who do you know? Invite some people to church. Invite them to church. We're trying to make heaven full, not center stage full. Dang it. Heaven full. When you bring people here, don't make us look good. It makes God look good. Because he's like, oh, got another one. Got another one into the pearly gates. Got another one that's coming to meet me. And if you're in this room and you're just like, I want to be saved, but I just don't want it to be awkward. Forget that. Get up. If you're in the room right now and you don't know Jesus, just stand up. We're not doing the whole, everybody close your eyes. No, we need to see what God is doing. We need to see the transformation. If you're in the room right now and you're like, I've never said yes to Jesus, or you even think that maybe you did it, maybe you just kind of started popping up, coming to church, but you actually haven't said the salvation prayer, you actually haven't had a real relationship with God, just stand up right now and we about to pray. I'm going to pray right now. For those of you even watching online, if you're in the room and you just stumbled upon this feed, stand up right now, wherever you are. It doesn't matter that we can't see you. God sees you. That's literally all that matters. Jesus, we thank you so much that you died on a cross for the people that are standing today. You risked it all for us, for this moment, so that we could see you and know you. And that we wouldn't be alone in our valleys when they come because they do come. So for those of you in the room or watching online, just say this prayer. God, I love you. Even though I don't know you. I love you because you sacrificed for me. You sent your son Jesus to die for my sins and give me victory over them. I believe that Jesus died, but I also believe he rose from the dead. And that was the moment that God looked at my story and said, here you go. You can be set free. And so today I am set free. It's in Jesus name. Everyone in the church said amen and amen. Hi, come on, Pastor Joe. Come and live your life. Love you all very much. See you outside. Can we just celebrate Jesus for Pastor Tony? Hallelujah. What a word.